Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week, we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit the subscribe button for more great true crime content. If you would like to help support Indie Drop-In, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from You Didn't Let Me Finish. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe to You Didn't Let Me Finish and to follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Hello. Hello, Victoria. Hello, Benedict. Oh, I get the full name treatment. Am I in trouble? <laughs> I think you always are a bit in trouble, aren't you? You like yeah, to keep it that so. way. When I was a child, it was always, if it was my full name, I knew I'd done something wrong. Well, you were quite a naughty child, weren't you? <laughs> yes, possibly. <laughs> now, now you're still a naughty boy. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> a very naughty boy. And talking of naughty boys... Mm. We've got a little bit of that kind of stuff coming up in the podcast today, haven't we? We, we yeah, we, we talk a lot about naughty boys, don't we? And Alleged naughty, naughty boys, boys gonna... sometimes. <laughs> well, no, one of the naughty boys we're talking about today is definitely a very naughty boy. He's the um, Antoni Imiella, the M25 rapist. We're going to come on to him in a little, wo- little while. I'm Ben Ando. I'm a former BBC news correspondent, crime reporter, and I also used to work um, for ITN and Channel 5 News. And did you love that? I loved it. I loved my time at ITN. ITN was just a fantastic organisation to work for. Big shout out to ITN. Hey, what about the BBC? Yeah, BBC's okay, but ITN. No, really? The BBC, no, the BBC was wonderful and ITN was wonderful. They're both, they're both brilliant news organisations full of really talented people. <laughs> wonderful. I think, I think you're right there. I'm Victoria Mitzi. I'm a journalist and a former fitness instructor, which you told me to say before. I'm a country bum. Kin. You said I didn't earn the kin yet. I don't know. I think, maybe, I think maybe another week's gone by. Maybe you had a, you've earned wow, a kin. Wow, in a week's time. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and a nosy Parker. Really? We're all that, aren't we? Yeah, we're you are. Nosy. Yeah, twitching neck curtains over your way. quite nosy Parkers as well. And that's why we're like true crime. And that's why we don't let each other finish. So on with the pod then. <laughs> We want your views on whether Johnny Depp's been a naughty boy, and indeed the son would like to know. Coming up is uh, an interview with Nick Wallace, who's been live tweeting from the trial at the High Court. Yeah, that's right. It's the it is a criminal case. It's a defamation case. It's not like you have. um, This is not a prosecution carried out on behalf of the Queen. This is two uh, very rich people going up against each other, or rather, one very rich person and one very rich news organisation. It's also been in the news because of domestic violence being high on the news agenda. But first, we'd like to talk to you, listening to us and enjoying us wherever you may be. It's you who keeps us going and you're the reason that we're here. So we don't have adverts, as you know, and enjoy. Some of the biggest podcasts I scroll through, (laughs) obviously I listen to the six minutes of adverts that I'm hit with, but we'd like to keep it that way and we'd like to keep it that way for as long as we can and we're putting in the graph to make sure it stays that way. But all we need you to do is rate, subscribe and review. But I have to rape, subscribe and review? (laughs) No, that's Anthony Amelia's job. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, he's dead now, but yes, it was. Or any of the other naughty boys that we feature on this podcast. (laughs) Listen, I met somebody at a barbecue who listens to our podcast. So I'm going to say hello to Rosie. Thanks very much for your kind feedback. I've told Victoria all the points that you made about how terrible she is and she's going to be much better in future. Isn't that right, Victoria? (laughs) I was wondering where this was going to go. No, Rosie said you were lots of fun and she really enjoys listening. So thanks to you, Rosie. Oh, really Rosie, I am someone. lots of fun. <laughs> God. Oh, As I'm, I'm sure you are now. too. I like Rosie. In fact, I think I love you. But if you subscribe, I'll love you even more. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see where this is going? Oh, no, thanks God. for that feedback. We love it. If you like what you hear, just hit that button and it keeps us going without having to annoy you with... DIY, you know, advertising for fertiliser or something like that, or whatever it is I have to listen to. Buy your underarm deodorant from this yeah, or that If you or the recreate other. the ads now, they're literally having to listen to them. <laughs> and, and, and the advertisers are getting the advertising for free as well. I think people might... I'm not going to say advertisers, am I? But um, I thought Sponsors, that it, my they? idea of how adverts go would be hugely entertaining, but obviously I'm just running away with myself now I've had one compliment from Rosie. 
My favourite adverts were those that we used to have when I worked in local radio for, for double glazing and things like that. They were just so awful. Your See? Ears would and it makes you want to sing one. Like the big red building on Golders Green Road. <laughs> Is it yellow building? I can't remember, but who knows where that's from? Hands up. Shake and back and put the freshness back. Do the chicken back. (laughs) Come on. We all know that. People have made their, well, people I know who may be listening to this have made their entire names from a specific advert. So, so important and powerful. Yes, indeed. You don't listen to me ever. Well, what people have made their names from adverts? Actually, a potential guest who I was speaking to not long ago. Are we going to feature the Shaken Vac woman? Oh, <laughs> it's not Shaken Vac. It's another. It's actually a bigger uh, advert than that. Which is is it Captain Birdseye? So well, <laughs> I'll keep you guessing. He's going to talk talk. To you us didn't all let me piracy. finish podcast at gmail dot com, <laughs> and I'll just talk over you. I'm going to give Captain Birdseye the black spot. <laughs> you do that. <laughs> Moving on, then. Okay. You may have heard this in the news over the past few weeks. Pictures of bruised arms and bleeding hands have been filling our front pages and online news feeds over the past two days. The images of the very unhappy marriage of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. The claims and counterclaims about their relationship are playing out in a libel battle in the High Court, both, of course, denying the accusations. That was a clip from a BBC News bulletin, wasn't it, on the radio? That's right. So what happened was, um, in April 2018, Dan Wooten, who is the Sun's showbiz correspondent, um, just wrote an article about the casting of Johnny Depp in the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them film franchise, in which he made defamatory comments, calling Johnny Depp a wife-beater. So Johnny Depp is suing uh, for libel. The Sun is maintaining that its story is accurate. And, of course, what this has done is... Johnny Depp is now appearing in court and is having to explain to this libel hearing how he's not a wife beater. Of course, in doing that, he's literally laying bare all these details about the relationship that he has with his um, his ex wife Amber Heard. And I mean, some of it is, is is almost comedy gold, dare I say? I mean, you know, these are serious allegations the son has made, and obviously Johnny Depp feels that they are defamatory to him. But he's talked about how. On, in, their, in their household, it would be normal for them to have dinner in front of the television and then to sit on the, the, the sofa together. But he said that she was really attention-seeking. And if, for example, he didn't hold her hand, she would grab her hand and put it on her thigh so that she was feeding the attention, which doesn't seem like terrible behaviour to me, but, but there we go. And um, What's she's not claiming... terrible about that? What do you mean? Well, taking somebody's hand and sort of wanting to, to have physical contact with them, if they're your partner, doesn't seem beyond the realms of, of Not of if you can't media. watch a telly programme without needing their attention. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Mm, yeah, Don't maybe. sue me. Yeah, well, quite. Anyway, so, 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 uh, so but, but what we're going to be talking to, I mean, you know, this, this is a, co- a case that sort of we have been following from outside, but um, Nick has been in court listening to this, so I'm really looking forward to having a chat with Nick and hearing what he's got to tell us about it. Yes, and when you said bordering on the comedy, um, I'd like to refer to something that I've put on our at YDLMF podcast Twitter. Amber Turd is the headline (laughs) featured in the Daily Star. Actor blamed wife for poo in bed. (laughs) And it goes on. She's never going to live Amber Turd down, is she? She certainly wants the attention, if that's true. (laughs) I say put her in detention, if that's true. (laughs) I'd say put her in nappies. (laughs) She literally (laughs) shat the bed. She shat the marital bed. But apparently that was the uh, that was the deal clincher for leaving, he said. But is is the allegation though that the the matter involved, the stool, was placed in the bed. It wasn't that she was in bed and just decided, I can't be bothered to get up, I'm just gonna poo right here. The allegation is that she pooed elsewhere and then somebody transported the poo. Amber Heard or one of her cohort, I think is how it was described, trans transpooed, tra- transported the poo from wherever she did it to the marital bed and placed it gently in there for Johnny to find. Well, actually, the poo is quite contentious, Ben, because (laughs) (laughs) um, apparently Sasha Woss QC, who made the assertions that it was Boo, one of the couple's two Yorkshire Terriers, who had problems with her toilet habits. Oh, it was a Boo poo, not an amber turd. (laughs) 
<laughs> How no, it could. But the other option from Sasha Voss was that it's possibly one of her friends. <laughs> I don't know if they mean a doggy friend or a human friend. (laughs) But Mr. Depp batted that back, saying the dogs were very well trained. (laughs) The barrister said, It came to your attention on the day of Amber's actual birthday that the cleaner had found faeces in the bed. (laughs) That's shit. (laughs) (laughs) anyway on that note i'll just say that we've got nick wallace who's also a a radio for panorama journalist and he's yeah he's live tweeting the ngn Depp libel trial at the uk high court so we'll be hearing from him a little bit later great (laughs) ben do you think that we have we got right to the crux of that trial (laughs) Yeah, quite possibly. I think they shouldn't wield us in. I really think they shouldn't. I really think they shouldn't. (laughs) We could tell them a thing or two about shitting the bed. (laughs) (laughs) You speak for yourself. (laughs) Uh, Moving on. Mm. (laughs) Um, So where are we going now? I think I'd like to talk about um, Anthony Imiela, the M25 rapist. So he um, he uh, carried out a series of, of rapes and sexual assaults in a period between 2001 and 2002. And these um, crimes took place in a sort of an area around the M25, Surrey, Kent, Berkshire, London, Hertfordshire. Um, there, there, were, um, there was one in Birmingham as well. And the, the press dubbed him the M25 rapist because people noticed pretty quickly that all these attacks took place quite close to the the sort of the orbital motorway that rings London. Right. So obviously, you know, there was a lot of fear at this time at this the, the idea that there, there was this serial rapist on the loose. And so the police, uh, the Kent and Surrey police, where most of the crimes took place, jointly launched an investigation called Operation Orb. And they put out huge public appeals for information. Um, and, then, and this resulted in a woman coming forward who expressed suspicion about her neighbour. Um, and then, luckily, the police had some DNA from some of the crimes, some of the crime scenes. They carried out a DNA swab test on this neighbour, a man named uh, Tony Imiela, and that enabled the police to link him to the attacks. And I remember covering his trial a couple of years later, because it took quite a while for this to happen. And he was sentenced to seven life sentences to serve eight years minimum. And then later, in 2010, he was charged with the rape, indecent assault and buggery of another woman, 29-year-old Sheila Yankovitz. Now, the reason we can name her is because she had actually died before the case came to court. Um, The the alleged offence took place on Christmas Day, 1987, in south-east London. And although she had died in 2006... Um, Imiela was charged and in 2010 he appeared in court and t- through 2011 to answer these charges and he was found guilty and he was uh, given an additional 12 years in prison and you know round about now it, it's quite possible that he would have been eligible to start thinking about parole however he died in prison in uh, 2018 which will not I'm sure upset very many of those victims of him can you Mm. give me just the frame that you normally give about how we come to cover these trials and where we're working at the time yes so at that time i was working for uh, channel 5 news i was working for itn and they provided the news channel 5 as before my bbc days i do remember the trial took place at uh, maidstone crown court and uh, yeah i went to some of the locations where he had carried out these attacks to do background filming background work. The police at the time also released quite a bit of CCTV and recordings of interviews that he had given. They, I remember one particular piece of footage was him, when he was first arrested and brought into court and ch- uh, to be charged. And it was interesting because we knew his name was Antoni Imiela. Um, we knew he was um, Polish, had been born in Germany. But what none of us quite had cottoned onto was the fact that he had grown up in, in northeast of England. And so when he's talking to the custody sergeant, he's got this broad Geordie accent, which was was quite surprising actually, um, and and not a little incongruous because he, he you know he he'd been built up as this M twenty five rapist and he was Polish. He'd been born in Germany. I'm I'm not entirely sure that any of us expected him to sound like uh, Gaza when he was speaking, or like you know one of the, and the one comparisons of the guys end there. Alf Wiedersehen, pet. 
Oh, but no, I mean, um, the, but the list of crimes, I mean, I'll go through them quickly. Hmm. So 2001, the first attack was on a, a 10-year-old girl who was kidnapped from a leisure centre in Ashford in Kent and raped in Woodland. Then 2002, about six months later, a 12-year-old girl was abducted while cycling in Berkshire um, and she was raped. Again, the same month, just a two, two, two weeks later, a 30-year-old woman was raped in uh, Earlswood in Surrey. And then six hours after that, a 26-year-old woman was raped on Putney Common in London. Um, so those happening very close to each other. So then we're on to the, six, the 16th of July. And he's really, um, I suppose, getting into his stride here because after... A huge gap between 2001 and 2002, which often leaves police thinking, did he just carry out attacks that were never reported to the police or just weren't known about? It's quite possible. In 2002, though, so 1st of July, then the 11th of July, two attacks, and the 16th of July, rape in Woking uh, in Surrey of an 18-year-old woman. And then in August 2002, again, just a couple of weeks later, a 52-year-old woman was raped in Wimbledon Common. Again, the next day, the 7th of August, a 26-year-old woman raped in Epsom in Surrey. And then a bit of a gap to September 2002, a 13-year-old girl, again taken, abducted from her bicycle and raped in Woking in Surrey. Same month, September, a 22-year-old woman in Ripley in Surrey, but um, Imiela was bitten by her dog and ran off. So she was attacked but wasn't actually raped. Um, 2002, a 14-year-old girl abducted from Stevenage in Hertfordshire and raped at Knife Point. I remember going to that location, actually. It was kind of like a, a bit of sort of woodland between two housing estates. And, and then the last attack that he was convicted of is November 2002. That was a 10-year-old girl indecently assaulted in Birmingham. And, and, that, and that's the only one that was outside this kind of M25 zone. But some shocking, you know, shocking attacks on very young women and girls. Yes, and, that, and his MO, as they say, was stranger rape. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he didn't know these people at all. I think he was very much an opportunist rapist in that he would see, for example, young girls on their bicycles. He he, were, he was usually in a van. I believe he was a railway worker. And so he would be travelling around to various locations to, uh, you know, um, maintain railway tracks or, or whatever it was he was doing as a, as a rail engineer. And on his way there, on his way back, he would see something and he would just think, right, and he would as I said, he often had a knife and he would approach his victims usually very quickly from behind, grab them, tell them he had a knife and then just take them into a secluded area where the attack would take place. He was also um, very well known for keeping trophies. He often would keep a, a garment of underwear or something similar, like a, a trophy of the, the crime he'd carried out. Mm, that's um, quite common, isn't it? Yeah, not not at all rare. The um, I mean, lots of murderers, lots of serial killers certainly are very well known for keeping trophies uh, of their victims. Yeah, and it goes together, as far as I understand, with the coercion, the control aspect that they then consider it some kind of accolade of what they've done. And that goes through the trial quite often, doesn't it? That I'm talking in general terms, of course, but something that I'm noticing from covering all these various different sexual and sort of deviant type of crimes and, and murders, where there's clearly a power element, that there seems to be a little bit of superiority complex mm-hmm. I don't know actually um, I mean one perhaps one of the most shocking you've mentioned um, it before yeah but what's the what's the complex a what superiority complex oh yeah I mean yes I suppose that's yeah very in very simple terms they like to think they are getting one over on the police they like to think they're getting one over on society they like to think they can tr- control things around them so for example in the past we've talked about um, Levi Belfield as an ob- obvious example they like to feel that by releasing tiny bits of information or saying, yes, we will tell you where the victim's body is and if, the, if that's never been found, they can somehow kind of, even from their prison cell, still exert some kind of control. And this goes all the way back to um, Brady and Hindley, the Moores murderers, because y- you probably won't remember Victoria, but certainly in the late 1980s, Hindley and I think Brady as well were, in, were separately taken from their respective secure hospitals, prisons, to the moors because I think Hindley had intimated that she would be able to take police to where one of the victims, Keith Bennett, had been buried. But of course the body was never found and um, Keith Bennett's mother, Winnie, went to her grave never knowing what had actually happened to her son, or at least never having a body to bury and to mourn. I think it's a testament to how big those crimes were and how big they were in the media, certainly, that I do remember. I remember the names of the children, even though I was a very small child, and possibly because my parents were talking about them, because Mm. you can't imagine anything worse. 
No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, murdering small children and then recording their screams. It's just, it goes beyond belief. But you know, talking of recording, bizarrely, one of the, perhaps the most um, shocking, um, notable um, things that Antoni Imiela did was um, that in one of the uh, cases, he used the victim's own mobile phone an hour after raping her to phone the victim's mother and then to taunt her about what he'd done. Oh, my God. So he told her about the offence? Yeah, he, he taunted her. He said, you know, I, I don't know exactly that what words were used. I, I can't recall. But he, he, he basically phoned up his victim's mother using her mobile phone to, to taunt her mother about what had happened. Were there any mental health issues? No, no, well... Officially. That's a big dip- yeah, I mean, that's a debate for another day. Um, no, there was no there was no mitigation, there was no suggestion from the defence that Antoni Imiela was um, anything other than of sound mind. I certainly recall that, they, that there was evidence that he was not, shall we say, the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, he was not thought to be of a very high intellect. He was, um, I mean, there was definitely evidence suggesting that he was kind of... Um, borderline, you know, having learning difficulties. But, um, you know, he had a career, he had a job, he was a, as far as anybody else knew, he was a functioning member of society. And then, as I said, he was, he was so he was sentenced to prison. He, While in jail, he was convicted of another um, rape on uh, Christmas Day, 1987. He had time added on to his sentence. But then, um, at the age of 63, because he had heart problems, uh, he was found in his cell um, in Wakefield Prison. And... Uh, and he'd um, collapsed, he'd had some kind of a, 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 a heart problem, and although obviously the prison staff you know, did their best to revive him and get him um, emergency medical care, he, he died, and the cause of death was natural causes. And um, you saw him in court? Yeah, 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 I mean, I saw him, I can't, I don't think he gave evidence in his own defence. I think that he um, he was... Uh, one of those who decided not to try and... Um, uh, possibly because he realised that he wasn't particularly uh, clever or he wouldn't be a particularly... Or he accepted the advice, perhaps, from his parents. Exactly. He, he wouldn't be a particularly sympathetic uh, witness in his own defence, so he didn't uh, give evidence. As, oh, you don't think that the accent could possibly have softened the jury a little? Well, in the way that um, call centres are staffed with people from the North East, because that's considered by most people to be the warmest and friendliest accent. You know where I'm going with this, Ben. <laughs> no. Well, I, I mean, th- my recollection of, of his voice from having heard it on these, um, you know, on these tapes, and also, you know, he did speak occasionally to confirm his name, that kind of thing, was that he, it was a fairly guttural. It wasn't the, the most charming, gentle, lilting uh, North East accent you've ever heard. You know, it wasn't Cheryl Cole. Well, it may have been a little mixed with um, German and Polish, so imagine that one. Yeah, bonkers. Bonkers. <laughs> so that's Antoni Imiela, the M25 rapist. I wanted to say something about the domestic violence aspect, because that's been in the news along with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, because, in fact, the bulletin that we just played... Radio 4, the way that they introduced it was you have seen the pictures of, you know, mutilated fingers and so on. And therefore, we're going to talk about domestic violence increased in lockdown, which is something that we've mentioned before. And I thought it was quite interesting that that was the way that they took it forwards, because certainly nothing's been, you know, it's a it's a libel action and it's kind of an aspect within the case. It's It's really common sense isn't it you know that if you get people who are maybe not in the the best relationship and they are cooped up inside a house for a period of time and you know when it's going on they're not entirely sure how long that period is going to be it could be anything from you know what we told at the start it could be six weeks it could be 12 weeks nobody really knew um then it's quite clear that there'll be tensions and in some cases those tensions will erupt into violence and most of the time, the violence will be male on female, but there are cases, as we know, that have been reported of, um, of women um, being violent to their male partner. It's quite possible there will be more violence than there would be if those people were getting a breather from each other. Yes, and children are being included in the under that umbrella term of, of abuse and, and violence. So Yes, and that's desperately sad, of course. We've covered so many crimes so far that have you know included 
children certainly the there was a huge aspect of domestic violence which actually at the time of um fred and rose west's offenses was not really counted as that so much and that was a big reason why a lot of the crimes weren't picked up on or followed up by police without further ado our guest today journalist Nick Wallace, who is Radio 4, Channel 5, Panorama, and currently live reporting the Johnny Depp versus NGN libel trial at the UK High Court. And that started on the 7th of July. Nick, you know, thanks very much indeed for joining us. We're really glad to have you here. It's an absolute honour to be here. The trial itself is, is is something of a circus i mean you've got not not, not obviously the within the courtroom but outside it you've got all the paps and uh, people trying to catch the shots of johnny that they want and uh, amber heard um, and inside they're utilizing five courtrooms because the, the royal courts of justice as, as i'm sure you both know virtually empty at the moment because of the covid situation so to uh, enforce social distancing and to take advantage of the fact they've got so much space they've got the principal courtroom which is court 13 They've got the uh, another courtroom just for lawyers because I imagine that uh, all parties taking you know uh, giving evidence to come completely lawyered up with this, uh, and then they've got a reporters' court and then two courts for members of the public, which I, ha- I haven't seen a single member of the public because the raw courts of justice are so vast. All these courts are all over the place. I haven't seen anyone who's queuing up to get into the the public courts because the reporter court is in a completely different building. So it's quite it's quite it's quite an interesting setup they've got going on. Have you seen Johnny? doing his entrances that we've all seen well no because we have to go in early to get our place in the reporter's room however when i made an application to the court on friday morning to get the transcripts uh, i went and sat on my own outside court 13 physically handing these applications to the various counsel wandering past and the judge's clerk and uh, so i saw mr depp stride past me i i was momentarily brushed uh, by his charisma as he walked into court holding a coffee cup it, it was it was a little performance uh, he sort of was, was sipping his coffee cup he, he handed his coffee cup to his security and then sort of did a little bow to the woman who the usher who was holding the door open for him and and strode in so he was in character by the time he got to court yes i've noticed that they're quite willing to do the shots looking quite jolly i mean they they are seeming to be in character I mean, Johnny Depp's been famous since he was 21, and um, I think he lives his life in character. He is who he is. He's, he's, I mean, I was, I, I'm not in the same court, and that is a, a crucial issue. But he is, comes across as an immensely charismatic person. He is clearly very intelligent. He chooses his words, uh, although sometimes he's sort of slurring and drawling a little bit too much. He's, he's, he's very, very particular about what he says. He's very well read. He's obviously got great cultural appreciation, particularly counter-cultural appreciation, which he keeps trying to digress into at length, but gets cut short. Uh, and yeah, he's playing the part of a Hollywood star who has nothing to hide, being incredibly polite and attentive to both the barrister who is regularly accusing him of domestic violence and to the judge which either is part of his natural manners or has been uh, made aware that he needs to be incredibly attentive and polite whilst he is sitting in the witness box. Is this case being tried or being heard in front of a jury or is it just a judge who's going to make it? No it's just a single judge Mr Justice Nickel. so in that regard publishing everything that's happening is um and publishing the transcripts and evidence and all that sort of thing is 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 open season in a way. It's just extricating it from the court service, which which can be tricky at times. And it was my work on the post office trial that gave me a, a backgrounding not only in the live tweeting and the uh, the monetizing, I suppose, through through crowdfunding, uh, but also the methods by which you should try and get what you are not quite entitled to, but by convention should be allowed to see and get your hands on. How does it work? Because when tweeting started coming in for court reporters, that was when my court reporting, just my duties changed in what we do. So um, how does it actually... Okay, on. How, how, did you, how did your duties change? You know, they don't want people to report from court so much. Mm-hmm. That was simply it, and I just started doing other stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, that's so I started doing reporting and reading at that time, and then I didn't go back to court reporting very much. So, how does it actually work? The sort of tweet. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued how it works with the tweeting and and what whether you have to have a specific method to do it if you're just focusing on that media. 
I developed a technique which I used in the two post office trials, which was to link my laptop to my mobile phone's uh, 4G signal. So uh, my phone became a Wi-Fi hotspot. And then I did the tweeting on an app called TweetDeck, which I think most people are aware of. It's a, it's a really powerful app and a little bit quicker than refreshing your browser it, it allows you to it refreshes within the app a tiny fraction quicker so you just bash out what you hear as you hear it hit uh, publish and you, you have a two or three second lag which is infuriating because of course you're then losing you're, you're getting behind uh, and then you, you put in the next tweet and you, you become sort of pretty expert at uh, using the right shorthand that people can still understand, but 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 at the same time allows you to type that tiny bit more quickly. I mean, I'm not a trained typist, so it, I, I just go as hard as hard and as fast as I can. And of course, your legal obligation is to be contemporaneous, accurate, and fair. So you don't have to be comprehensive, and you don't have to publish everything verbatim, so long as you are accurate and fair in what you write which is i suppose where your journalist training comes in um you are able to just channel what is being said in court and put it out there but i always put a disclaimer at the top of every day's uh, live tweeting saying look what you are hearing is a summary and a paraphrase of what's being said you are not having verbatim quotes unless i get lucky and I, I i get a verbatim quote that goes straight into my head and there's a little pause in proceedings afterwards so that i can ensure that i've got it absolutely spot on uh, it's never very anything very interesting but i'm always quite proud when i can actually get an actual verbatim tweet out uh, but yeah as i say it's summary and paraphrasing which is why i was so keen to get the transcripts because of course uh, the live tweets have a value in the second that they are being published but the transcripts are for the ages, aren't they? So get, getting hold of those is what is what people will be relying on once the once the tweets are a distant memory. And how do you find that tweeting has been on this particular trial? It was phenomenal because I I I wasn't required to tweet for five news. I was there to do a VT for for five o'clock. So I uh, but because I I suppose I enjoy it and because i thought well i'm just going to be sitting here otherwise soaking it all up i might as well make myself useful and five news uh, is very active on social media and twitter so i thought well, this this will be potentially might grow some interest in in my report later on which we would then tweet out obviously after it had been broadcast uh, I, I just started bashing out the tweets and suddenly my mentions started flipping in a way that i have never seen i have got more followers in the last five days than i have over 12 years of being on Twitter I've gone from 6,000 to something like 14,000 over the space of uh, five days I, 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 and it was flipping in a way that I couldn't quite believe I thought oh my goodness I, I, I should have realized of course he's one of the most famous men in the world um, and he has a loyal and devoted fan base and uh, me too and issues of domestic violence are very very um, uh, considerably uh, you know front and center in terms of the, the national debate um, and the international debate and so all these Americans who were clearly desperate for information about what was happening in this trial very, very quickly told their friends that there was a British journalist in court live tweeting. And the response, the reaction was, was just phenomenal to the extent that uh, at the end of the day, I sort of, because I didn't have any work Wednesday to Friday, um, I sort of half jokingly tweeted, oh, maybe I should just turn up tomorrow and, 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 and continue doing the live tweets for fun. And the avalanche of replies I got um, begging me to do it made me think, well, yeah, might as well. I'm not doing anything else. If they don't let me into court because I haven't got a, a Channel 5 News uh, accreditation, then I'm going to do some work sitting in a press manger in central London. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, if, if I could find one that was open. Um, and I, I said, I'll, I'll give it a go. I didn't. And then, and then I realised that because I crowdfunded the um, the post office story, and I had a, a a tip jar essentially, which could be utilised for any purpose. I thought, well, if if the people in America could just chuck me, you know, enough to buy a cup of coffee and my bus fare, then I, I'll I'll you know just do it at a modest loss. And once I had managed to wangle my way into court, I, I put a couple of links up to the crowdfunding page that I've got. And uh, very quickly had paid for my entire day rate <laughs> to be there. So it was, it was, it was great. It was really gratifying. And so I just carried on doing it 
Thursday and Friday, and I, I've I've got it. I'm confident that I've potentially got enough um, left to to at least do Monday next week, uh, and and maybe a bit more. That's amazing. When I've been tweeting from court, certainly in criminal trials is a bit different, but certainly I did a tweet from a an appeal around the Badger Cull a few years ago. And I can't recall the exact circumstances, but I remember, of course, you know, first of all, you get the um, the animal rights, if you like, barrister setting out the case for the appeal and the appellants. And then, of course, you had the um, the barrister acting for the, the, the government on this mm. and setting out the case for having a badger cull. And I was tweeting about these and sort of saying, you know, you know, so and so barrister says da 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 da, and I I was getting sort of lots and lots of this is brilliant BBC, you know, from the animal rights people. When I was tweeting what the barrister on their behalf was saying was this is great BBC reporting what's going on in the court, you know, this, the, the, these poor badgers, so and so. Then when I started tweeting what the other barrister was saying, who was saying what the government's position was, it just flipped and suddenly it was typical BBC bias, you know. Out- <laughs> outrageous nonsense <laughs> not telling the truth you know and it's like wow you really, you do understand don't you that both <laughs> barristers get a chance to speak in this and i just wondered if you've when you've been say um tweeting you know what maybe uh, johnny depp's some representatives are saying it's all sweetness and light but if you're tweeting perhaps what what sasha is it sasha was is acting for um the newspaper i can't yeah, remember sasha Wass is, yeah. sasha was cross-examining uh johnny depp all week basically so she was pushing it to him that he was a he was a, a wife beater and he was he was denying it and uh, well I, I mean i would I, I i would hesitate to speculate but there are a huge number of johnny depp fans following this and mm. they are very very well versed in the he said she said of all this and they they are absolutely certain as to who is in the right and who is in the wrong here um, but i just have to say i again with the disclaimer about being um paraphrasing and summarizing i also say look i have a legal duty and a professional duty to be absolutely straight down the line on this i'm not and, and i get people in my dms because i have my dms open and i do a sort of at the end of the day i say look if you've got any questions about this trial that you want me to answer just dm me and i'll do my best to do it in in, in the evening and, and so many of them want to know which way it's going and whose side am i on and i have to just say no look it's, it's straight down the line i i, I don't <laughs> i don't know whether i'm gonna when it's when it flips and amber heard starts giving evidence uh, or, or, or being cross-examined that i'm suddenly going to have people turn on me <laughs> which is I, a, I, a, an interesting thought <laughs> absolutely i mean i you know johnny depp as you said has got you know a large sort of you know there'll be lots of fanboys and girls who are reading what you're saying and then at the moment as you as maybe it's they can see that it's him getting to speak and you're you are tweeting with you know give and take what he is saying as best you can and they're understanding that but when they start hearing from her side i wonder if it if it, there will be some pushback and you will find people not quite able to make the distinction between you as a correspondent in court simply um reflecting what's going on um it, it'll be interesting to see I, I that's what i i mean that kind of was an education for me as to how people don't really necessarily understand what they are reading um, because they don't look at the entire threads and i suspect there'll be lots of people just dipping in who see yeah. a couple of tweets and start yeah. firing you know get that social media anger going <laughs> but it's good stuff <laughs> I mean, it's, but, it's an interesting website twitter i mean i don't i don't think if i w- was wasn't a journalist i would be i i mean it because it does bring out the worst in people but it is such a wonderful platform for so many different aspects of a lot of people's work actually you know it's been a genuine education being on that particular site um that you just i suppose develop techniques to filter out the huge amounts of abuse that flies around towards other people and i, and I suppose i suppose i mean I, I suppose i've got quite a thick thick hide as a journalist now and if if people want to have a go i think the, the best thing to do is ignore them if people want to be nice uh then then it's it's nice to interact and respond and i mean it, it, it's 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 heartening to get lovely tweets uh from people and if you're going to accept that that you are affected by lovely tweets from people then you've got to roll with the punches when they come i wanted to ask about the details of the case and um amber heard is going to start giving evidence amber heard's on friday we've got a number of uh johnny depp flunkies Monday, Tuesday, I think all the way through to Thursday. Then Amber Heard starts on Friday. She's due to give evidence for, I think, two and a half days, although given how much Johnny Depp slipped, it could go longer. And then all her associates and flunkies will come after her into the third week of the trial. So that's so we're going to hear from Winona Ryder and Vanessa Paradis for Johnny Depp this week, during which they're expected to say uh, he never laid a finger on a scuv. Okay. And... 
what Depp is claiming is that Heard has is setting him up as a part of a hoax. Yes, I, I don't really understand. Exactly. Could that, you this, this more is, about it? Yeah, well, this is Sasha Wass's line of attack. She has two main prongs of attack. The first is that uh, Johnny Depp has taken so many drugs over the course of his adult life that he blacks out um but before he blacks out he gets very angry and then he does things that he can't remember whilst he is blacked out um and and her insinuations is that this is when he commits the acts of violence that he says um uh, that that he didn't do and the other prong of the attack is uh, that 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 getting johnny depp to potentially sound rather ridiculous with the idea that from even before she met him uh he was she was planning to uh, sort of ingratiate herself with him spend a number of years with him marry him and then claim that he was uh, an abusive husband in order to secure her position and uh, I mean the disdain in Sasha Wass when she says and you call this all part of the hoax do you and and as he politely says yes man um, you know <laughs> you can't speculate on what view the judge will take of that um, and it may well be that Ms. Heard was planning to uh, you know become the sort of person that Johnny Depp would want to marry and then take him to the cleaners afterwards um, but it, it, it's definitely part of uh, NGN's case that suggesting this is implausible. What stood out to you? Because we were talking, Ben and I were talking a little earlier um, in in the podcast about um, the defecation matter of defecation that was discussed over the past last week. Now, um, what, what's what else has stood out? Has that been? Because that doesn't seem to be very clear either. No, it hasn't been resolved. I mean, Johnny Depp is absolutely insistent that uh, his cleaner found human feces in their bed. Uh, and uh, as far as he was concerned, there could be a number of culprits, um, either Amber Heard herself or uh, her associates. I mean, in court, he, he didn't speculate that it might have been Amber Heard and no one suggested that it was, although there were quotes that uh, <laughs> were revealed in case <laughs> in court from text that he sent at the time calling her amber turd or amber <laughs> uh, down in the dumps <laughs> and, and, and all that sort of thing you know he, he found it very very funny at first uh, and he admitted doing so in court because he also admitted having a very puerile and childish sense of humor sophomoric was the was the word that he used oh. and childish was another word that he used so so um obviously uh uh, you can imagine how Amber Heard is gas that uh, he would claim that it was uh, either her or any of her associates. And uh, um, NGN's case is that this is the, the one of the two dogs that they had uh, in their flat, um, one of whom was allegedly not very well toilet trained. I mean, but th- that... <laughs> I mean, it, it's 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 scatological and it's amusing in that regard but some of the other stuff is is very very dark i mean the, there is no doubt that uh he, he he has taken prodigious amounts of drugs throughout his life um and that um uh there there are there have been some well they, they he himself said that he and amber heard were a crime scene waiting to happen well they're alleging that in fact yes he he was the one committing that that crime uh, which you know he he continues to uh, deny so it, it, it some of the pictures that you see of some of the damage uh, the the lines of cocaine this this strange celebrity bubble that they lived in where they could get private planes and just ship off to different continents at the drop of a hat after a row and order drugs when they were in those continents which their flunkies would get for them that they could then ingest heavily and um either black out or have rows or or fights or whatever it, it is a very very strange uh, world to get a window into and, and it is grimly fascinating i mean you know he is a, a big uh, fan of the cancer culture and he's living that dream nick you mentioned um before that um sasha was i think had said um that because of his drug use throughout his adult life he has these things where he blacks out and the ses- just suggestion is he turns violent before he blacks out um is that so he, does he agree yes i do black out is that something he uh, acknowledges it's it's well it, the idea the the, the 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 position that that Sasha Wass is trying to put him in is the admission that he has no memory of how he has behaved 
Um, so he is mentally backing out in a way before he then physically backs out. And whilst he is mentally backed out, he commits acts of violence. Um, and he um, admits that he has thrown bottles of champagne, that he's punched light fittings. Um, and, and essentially, she uh, got as far as I think she was likely to need to do with the judge to suggest to Mr. Depp that actually his uh, apparent clarity of memory after ingesting 10 ecstasy tablets and, and a bottle of whiskey uh, was not perhaps as good as he might have been suggesting in his witness statements. And has there been any suggestion, because I think you also mentioned that when he's in court, he's very polite, but also he does tend to occasionally slur his words. Is there any suggestion that that's all part of the impact that drugs have had on him? Uh, well, actually, he, he I mean, I say occasionally slurring his words. He's picking his words carefully and he has a very southern drawl. So um, you, 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 but one thing that struck me is that he is uh, very sharp. He's very well read. He is very articulate. He is incredibly charismatic, and he has a lovely turn of phrase, uh, which which is a journalist's dream. Um, there is no doubt that he he um, uh, has uh, taken enough drugs to kill a bull elephant several times over, and I'd be surprised if it didn't have an effect on it. But he, he, he's not showing it in court. He's very dapper, very smart, very charismatic, and. Um, and, and and he just get the sense that he is used to having people listen to what he's saying. So he speaks with a very easy drawl and he's not used to having um, a, a, a quite strict, officious English QC with a received pronunciation telling him to stop talking because she needs to get to her next question. <laughs> There's a lot of yes, Mr. Depp, I think we've heard quite enough about that already. Now, would you mind just answering yes or no? Uh, but he doesn't react or respond or, or, or uh, take offence to her manner of questioning. He, 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 in a rather unfortunate phrase, said, I'm easy to roll with the punches, your lordship. <laughs> did, 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 that, did that surprise you that he didn't uh, push back or get maybe a little bit stroppier about being spoken to like that? Because it can't be something that happens a lot if he's an alien Hollywood, Hollywood star. No, I can't imagine it's happened to him in the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> it, it is either a measure of the coaching that he has had, and of course witness coaching is, is strictly not allowed, but I'm sure he would have taken advice as to what to expect, uh, or um, he he is acting uh, brilliantly uh, as someone who might inside or underneath uh, be fuming, but he, he has shown a couple of signs of exasperation, and certainly towards the end of a day of, of sort of six hours worth of um, being told that he is s someone who he, he, he considered to be, you know, beneath contempt, and, and being told that he is that person over the course of six hours, you know, he he was getting a tiny bit exasperated and weary, but but that's as far as it went. And certainly verbally, if you look at the transcript, it's no, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry, ma'am, that didn't happen, ma'am, and 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 uh, very very polite and cooperative throughout. Fascinating. I'd like to know about just a few. I know I know that uh, I don't want to keep you too long. I'm quite aware of that. Um, but I just wanted to ask about you the some of the details which you found. You mentioned that they were quite shocking. Is there anything for people who are kind of maybe tuning in and haven't been across the whole trial so far that you can kind of summarise as the shockers for us? Uh, well, there was the recording of him where he is holding a knife an audio recording and uh you can hear amber heard i mean it's very muffled but amber heard is is saying what are you going to do with the knife um trying to suggest or seeming to suggest that he might be about to attack her and uh his point of view uh which you could interpret from the very muffled uh, audio recording that he was saying you know i want you to cut me um uh, uh, because you you know you 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 you've taken you've taken my blood from me. Why not just take the actual blood? And so that was that was quite a dark moment. There were there were there were the 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 episode on the plane where uh, Johnny Depp claimed to have just been sitting there doing some light reading uh, and and drawing in his journal before uh, Amber Heard started an argument. So he he left that area of the private plane and went to sleep in its bathroom. Um, was um, contradicted by some of the evidence that Sasha Wasp brought up, which uh, in a text to Paul Bettany suggested that he drank two bottles of champagne, stayed up for several nights beforehand, ingested loads of cocaine and ecstasy, and uh, did, did and said 
some bad nasty things or became a bad nasty person on that flight which um again is that contrast between and, and during that flight he was alleged to have kicked amber heard in in the back uh because uh, because he, he got so frustrated with her remonstrating with him over uh his drug use so it, 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 it you know it, it's clear that his memory of what happened on that flight is faulty but that doesn't of course necessarily mean that uh, her allegation that he kicked her is the case, and and the the cutting off the tip of his finger um, is again he says was something that Amber Heard did by smashing a bottle down on his finger, uh, and uh, whatever happened in that room in, in Australia was pretty bleak and involved a huge amounts of, of, of cocaine and, and alcohol um certainly on his part and that's why it's not at all clear but but the, the um uh, amber heard's argument is that she wasn't even in the room when he did what he did and 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 so you you're, you're seeing a constant picture being painted of a man who at times in his life was hoovering up uh, controlled substances uh, to which which uh, you know i i, I <laughs> It, just the, the sheer volume that, that he was taking on board, both alcohol-wise and and, and uh, recreational drug-wise, um, plus the prescription drugs that he was on, you, you do wonder how superb his memory of those occasions must have been. But that doesn't necessarily mean he was engaged in domestic violence w- when he can't remember what he was doing. So that 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 is the general sort of thrust of the, the the back and forth that have been happening in court over the last week and i, I think it makes it very interesting as to what all the flunkies are going to say uh, this week because uh, you know, most of them are in uh, the pay of either johnny depp or amber heard i mean they are paid staff these are the people who were there to as sasha was said clean up the mess uh, that you've made not not confront you about your bad behavior and let, and leave you free to get on with the with with the next episode without any responsibility for your actions um which you know if, if you've seen entourage um, may well be a, a reasonable um, uh, sort of stereotyping of of what the people around Johnny Depp and Amber Heard do for them. So quite how reliable their evidence is going to be and, and, and how well it's going to stand up to forensic cross-examination by a very fierce QC will be really interesting to, to hear next week. So although to a certain, apart from Vanessa Parody and Winona Ryder, uh, there are no celebrity um, or star witnesses, these are the people who who do know where the bodies are buried, to use an unfortunate phrase, uh, and may well have an interest in defending um, their employer rather than uh, honesty to the court, which I think may well be a mistake if, if, they, if they're attempting to do that, given, given how skilled at cross-examination uh, both David Sherbin, um, who is Johnny Depp's barrister, and uh, Sasha Wosky CR. Brilliant. <laughs> thanks very, uh, thanks very much, Nick. That's been really interesting. Really given us a real flavour of what is like uh, uh, in the court there for the Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard and Sun newspapers uh, case. Yeah, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been great. Well, we haven't had a chance to talk about your other work. Um, so the the post. Oh, yeah. yeah, go for it if you want to. Right. Well, I was wondering if you might want to when maybe when this is kind of over and uh, and. Oh sort of, yeah. Yeah, no, sure, because the post office thing is going to blow up massively and, I, and, and you know, it's all going to start going through the Court of Appeal soon. So, yeah, if you want to get me on again, I'd, I'd love it, yeah. Yeah, no let's, let's dip into that one near the time when it's, yeah. sort of, you know, when it's live, yeah. Sure. Yeah, OK. Sure, no. and do you know, do you have a date for that? No, I don't know. We have no idea how the Court of Appeal is even handling this. Um, yeah. The various uh, claimants who've been referred have got different legal representations. So how... The, whether the Court of Appeal is just going to rubber stamp the CCRC um, recommendation, which I have a feeling they will, or whether the post office is going to um, uh, start contesting uh, the appellants who pleaded guilty um, rather than the ones they, they, they prosecuted who pleaded innocent. We don't know. That could affect how they're dealt with. So, or, or whether they're being dealt with by different legal um, teams could affect how they're being dealt with. You know, it, it, we're in uncharted territory because they've never referred this many people through to the Court of Appeal at any one time. And it's good, that number is definitely going to grow given how many more prosecutions they're reviewing. So it, it I, you know, it, it's going to provide me with some work going forward, I think. But I, have, I, I couldn't even begin to guess when, when it might get underway. Well, um, well, we'll keep our eyes peeled on that. And, um, and also then hopefully we'll, have, uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk to you a little bit more about this one. 
to. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, well I, I, I wonder when the judgment's going to come out. I mean, I'm guessing sort of after summer um, on this libel trial. So it'd be fun to do something maybe when that comes around, I don't know. That would be really good. And um, if also, I don't want to forget to ask you about your crowdfunding, how people can do that if they're listening to this. Oh, yeah. I've, I've, uh, it's nickwallace.com. I've got a website and it's uh, there's a little tip jar on my website and it's 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 actually worked out quite well. It's a sort of, I've, I've customised a, a, a a, a, a payment sort of a portal which is linked to paypal it, it's all very sort of you know you just if you just say nickwallace.com there's a there's a little thing button that says tip jar if anyone wants to but that honestly it's it's fine it's well I, I do like to because um it's well known amongst people who we get a lot of other podcasts listening to us and um it's it's become a, a way of life for people to be self-funded like this so we understand the system so um, oh great! Okay, yeah, well, Wallace dot com and then Tip Jar would, would be fantastic. <laughs> Put as much as you like in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it explains it all. It it, it it holds your hand through the process because I, I realise that people, for some people, you know, I've got lots of el not elderly, middle aged people who sort of well, part of the reason that they got in trouble with the post office horizon system in the first place is because they didn't understand IT all that well. So the, the idea of you know they're desperate to sort of help out, but then when you ask them to give card details online, they sort of get a little bit suspicious, and you sort of have to go, this is what you do. Don't be frightened by this. Then you'll have this. But thank you very much. All the same, you know, don't donate if you're remotely scared about it. But it is safe. Promise you. That's how you have to talk to is. us. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Hey, listen, thank Bye. you so much, guys. It's Take been, care, Nick. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Years for you. So, um, it's, it's a real honour to speak to you. And Victoria, it's really lovely to make contact with you. And thanks very yeah, much for inviting too. me on. And if you think of anything else as well um, that uh, that you'd like to sort of share, just you know, pop me a message. That'd be really great. Yeah, no problem at all. Absolutely. Take care, Nick. Nice to talk to you. Cheers, Cheers. guys. Take, Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. 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 Wasn't that great to hear from Nick? It's so it's it's great. You know, you, you can't beat when you hear from somebody who's actually been in court following a case, the, the mm. cut and thrust of it from moment to moment. It's Thanks. what we love to do, you and I. Yeah, absolutely. I love. I used to love uh, court reporting. Really enjoyed it. Always good. But especially that trial. Yes, yeah, that's fascinating, doesn't it? I mean, I, we haven't even heard from Amber Turd yet, but I'm looking forward to hearing from Amber. Um, I can't say Amber Heard now. <laughs> I don't think anybody will be able to ever again. <laughs> they didn't know much about the UK. The only the only until... winner here is Cockney rhyming slang. I'm just going for an amber. Oh no, I've just trod in an amber. <laughs> I've just shut the bed. <laughs> I've just ambered the bed. <laughs> oh, the doggies crept in and ambered the bed. <laughs> Naughty yeah. doggy. Why don't you see white ambers anymore? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such an amber. <laughs> Can't polish an amber. <laughs> you can, but you can roll amber in glitter. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't realise what was going to hit them. She's going to be completely befuddled if Johnny oh, Depp's is. like, "Yes, ma'am," and trying to do all his acting, and then she's like, "Look, can you just wind it up so we can move on?" <laughs> well, this is actually the thing, isn't it? Because what Nick was saying was how. You know, D Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, I bet the pair of them are never used to people uh, standing up to them, telling them no, actually interrogating what they're saying. It's just yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, three bags full, ma'am. <laughs> or three beds full, ma'am. But um... <laughs> Three pants full. <laughs> yeah, three bowls full. <laughs> Clearly, Johnny Depp has been able to keep it together and stay, you know, play that part of the sort of polite, courteous um, witness. Um, it'll be interesting to see if uh, Amber Heard manages to do the same. Well, I didn't get my celebrity details in there, my celebrity in the know information, but I have heard from staff that he is very quiet, very quietly spoken, very nice, never gives anyone any trouble unless the door's locked, obviously. <laughs> or unless there's a, t a herd in the bed. Unless you, unless who is it? Thora. Unless there's a Thora. That's the other one. That I'm sorry, the Sun should use that one. Put Thora and Amber on their front page. <laughs> Thora was Thora. Now it's Amber. <laughs> oh, Amber's the new Thora. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. Um, um, also, what you pointed out about that trial—that it's nice to um, to have a civil trial. Yes, absolutely. A bit different. 
Mm. And um, it treated in the way that, you know, Nick's kind of acting, you know, he's he's using Twitter in such an interesting way. And it's kind of engendered quite a lot of response from the States. Like we have a bit. Yeah. If, yeah, you're, oh, if you're listening, oh, some of our American friends are very nice about us and um, we love you listening to us. So hopefully this will give you more incentive because so Nick, Nick should come back to us, shouldn't he? Yeah, and, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think, update. you know, one, once we get to the end of this, um, it'll be interesting to have a little update from Nick and also for him to talk about his um, the other big scoop he worked on, which was the story about the post offices, which we'll come to on another podcast. Mm, yes, it's actually it's really good. So um, we'll revisit that. But moving on, uh, unless there's anything you want to say about. No, Johnny no, moving Depp. on. Go for it. Um, I'd like to extend that um, that thanks that I was giving to our American friends to all of our listeners. So thank you for listening. But what's important is to mention the all the follows that we've had. We're really touched by this because, uh, first of all, we didn't know how many of you would be listening to us. So thanks for that. But also the support on social media and the kind words from all of you. Uh, mainly you know the the also the podcast that we are working alongside in the true crime genre so um i'm going to name a few of you who've been quite supportive and i'd like to just say hello um sinister hood my brother's funnier than me always time for true crime malice lady justice as usual um because she's a friend of the podcast we had her last week as you know uh, unpredictably us uh, dos spukenios what a great name that is, isn't it, Ben, for a podcast? It's an awesome name. Dos Pukenios, you're fantastic. Uh, Reverie, as usual, we, we love your work. And the Detective Podcast, of course, um, our friend of the, the programme. Sorry, we're not a programme, are we? Are we a programme? Friend of, friend of the podcast, even. Uh, the Detective Podcast, so that's uh, Mark Williams Thomas, of course. And uh, all of your interactions uh, and... Um, of course, rate, subscribe and review because that's something that we've only just worked out is important to our survival here and continuing without ads because they're a pain in the bum. <laughs> if you're a podcast listener, well, there must be the thing that riles you most. It riles me most. So um, we can stay ad free and just be delightful for you. Di it directly delightful. <laughs> you're always directly delightful. Mm, I'm indirectly delightful as well <laughs> huh. um, yes so um i think that's it really oh yes the feedback i feel i want to talk about um some of the feedback that i've had about guests and it's been in various different sort of you know some, some of the people who live around here who i talk to um as well as people on socials and stuff that um different people like different guests and i think ben didn't that lady mention it to you who you spoke to Yes, she did. I had a. Uh, I met um, a lady at a barbecue who said she's a fan of the podcast, and she said that um, you know some of the guests she's um, she she doesn't she doesn't necessarily um, agree with everything they say, but she's interested to hear them say it. Um, and of course, we have got we are going to have a very interesting guest guest in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Can you we say hope. that in English? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to have a wedding. <laughs> you didn't let me finish it in English. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got a, well, you know, and we should probably just, you know, have a little sneak peek. We're not going to say who it is, but we have got somebody who's vastly experienced uh, in the world of crime um, and who I first encountered many years ago when I was working the crime beat and who's a lovely guy, um, very genuine and knows an awful lot and really does know what he is talking about. When you say vastly experienced and will it be will it be letting our listeners on to too much information, telling you in what respect? Sorry, I think... telling them in what respect? Uh, I, I just think, you know, I, I don't want to say too much because, you know, we, we need to... Um, I, I yeah, know. but not not the fact that he's like a prolific pickpocket. Well, no, he's not a criminal. <laughs> he's he's definitely not a criminal. <laughs> he's he's not picket. He's not picket any pocketed. <laughs> Pickety he's not, pocketing. He's, he's, he's not Have you got a hangover by any chance, Ben? <laughs> Possibly. Uh, he's not picked any pockets. He's um. But no, he's a, he's um. He's a he's a great guy, and is and he always talks a lot of sense. Vastly experienced, and really looking forward to having a chat with him with you as well. Great, and if you say that, you know what you're on about. So um, that's a endorsement if ever I heard exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. Is there anything else we've forgotten? 
I suppose just remind people you can email us as ever at you didn't let me finish podcast at gmail.com if you want to engage us on Twitter. I think our DMs are open, aren't they? It's, yeah, well, mine is. Have you opened yours up? Uh, on, uh, well, the at YDLMF podcast um, Twitter account Ooh. that we have. The I'll DMs just make are open sure. That, I'll make sure of that. So by the time okay. uh, you, by the this time reaches really hit, your ears. The DMs will be open, yeah. For um, sure. Great. So thanks to Nick, obviously. Um, uh, and we will talk next time. Thanks to you, Ben. Oh, and thanks to you, Victoria. You're wonderful. Um... No, I mean, no, you're amazing. No, I mean, really, you're amazing. <laughs> can um, can you tell me something about your life at the moment? Because we don't do our COVID updates now, do we? Um, oh, and I was going to give you a local update here. Oh, let's hear the local yes. update then. I'm all um, agog. Do you remember the freak accident cherry picker death? I do, yes. Yes, that was a Devonshire incident. I'm going to, I've got to find the right page. Give me a moment. Where did I open it up? Oh, I've got to scroll through something. One sec. Well, I remember what you told me. There was somebody well, the who inquest lives near is you. Underway. Ah, That's go on. the update. And what's been said at the inquest so far? Has it been reported? No, it's just been opened. So I just wanted to kind of say that that we're still keeping an eye on that, and we've get any further details. So the the update is for further updates. Well, I'm reasonably we sure that we should have you as our reporter in court, in the coroner's court, to, to, to ferret out the truth. Mm, well, I've been inspired by Nick's work. <laughs> mm, he's shown me how it's done. But, he has, um, absolutely. Yes, and uh, oh yeah, and we used to, to give our COVID kind of how our weeks were going. We don't do that anymore. So because I quite like to end the podcast on some kind of upbeat note. And then if we could, if you could possibly make me laugh... Oh gosh, that'd that's be a nice outro. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, you know, I suppose we're all getting back to normal, aren't we? I've been down to. A, I went down to London barbecue. I've. Um, Have you been, been down to London about. twice? Yes, I went down to see my friend Mike as well. We had a look few, at you in the big smoke, COVIDing it up. Absolutely, we went and sat in our socially distanced pub and had our socially distanced pints of Citra IPA. How do you do tasty. that with a mask on? Um, well, I, I've, I've got a straw, so I push the straw through the mask. No. No, I don't. <laughs> but I made you laugh. <laughs> the picture of me sitting there with my mask and a straw coming out of it. I'm supping my beer. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it might be like the, the those kind of curly straw glasses that we got on my dad. Well, actually, the barbecue... Well, I say it was a barbecue I went to. It was supposed to be a barbecue. And then when I got there, I discovered that the hostess, because she was trying to do a socially distanced thing, thought that a barbecue with people sort of walking up and being handed burgers and sausages and chicken wings and all the rest of it wouldn't work. So what she did was she just went out to Marks and Spencer and bought a shed load of packs of sandwiches, wraps, bags of Doritos and crisps and little tubs of sort of hummus and things and just said right there you are just help yourself and go and sit on chairs two meters apart to eat them <laughs> that must have been jolly did it, it feel was, like home it was actually a very it was a really nice party but it was slightly strange with the social distancing thing going on so it was a barbecue which didn't actually contain a barbecue yeah no no meat was grilled no barbecue <laughs> coals were lit no oh, men stood around i bet someone was a bit <laughs> miffed about that <laughs> no, no men stood around telling each other how best to get the barbecue lit <laughs> <laughs> what just just because the women really love hearing that oh i bet that fills them with joy it gladdens their hearts <laughs> oh i'd love to see your face when you turned up and they told you there was no big slabs of meat <laughs> heading your way oh. no eyes were rolled oh an egg and cress sandwich thanks i actually had a mexican three bean wrap i'll have you know <laughs> oh ranchero absolutely <laughs> <laughs> how wild you didn't wash it down with the tequila did you Arriba. What? I, I, I washed it down with um, some white wine and some Prosecco. Oh, pour it in, Ben. I did. It was lovely. I just, I liked your little flat Arriba burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's the, and... uh, the only Mexican I know. That's really Spanish. <laughs> oh, I don't it? know. We eat quite a lot of Mexicans, so we should know. If you oh, yeah. sit down and think about it, you'll know. Chimichanga, I know that. Guacamole. I know, oh, I know burrito. I love a burrito. Oh, we love it. That, that, when's your first um, post-lockdown burrito going to come <gasps> then? Oh, God. Oh, I want that. Um, I'm going to open the doors at oh, Benito's I'm just, hat. I'm just, and you'll be yeah. charging in like a bull. I will, yeah. Benito's fat. Benito's back. Oh. Oh, Benito's weird. back. 
and shows are fat tortillas. as well. There's one. Um, there's one in Cambridge that I might go to called um, Nana Mexico. I wonder if we can get sponsored by a burrito place. That's the only sponsorship I want. They'll give us free burritos. <laughs> Send me free burritos. Oh, Ariba. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to You Didn't Let Me Finish for the amazing episode. Check out the links in the show notes to subscribe. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.